Hello and thank you very much for the invite to speak today at the, today's Medcoms networking event. My name is Jane Packham and I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry for the last 25 years. Um, part of that is actually working within industry, working with MSD and Pharmacy as they once were. But uh, I've also now set up my own consultancy company where I specialise in sort of in-house training sessions on the code of practice. And that's what I want to talk to you to, um, about today and particularly focus on some of the common pitfalls that you might face if you're a medical writer. So in this session today, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the ABPI code of practice. But today I want to talk about some of the common pitfalls. So look at things like words, layout, how you actually present information from clinical studies. And just as a slight disclaimer really, that this session really just gives you a flavour. It's not comprehensive training. The code is about 50, 60 pages long, but I just want to give you a bit of a feel uh, for things to look out for. So first of all, I want you to think about a couple of things before you even start writing. You've got to be really clear on what is it. Sounds pretty obvious, I know. Is it a manuscript? Are you writing patient materials? Are you doing training materials? But that is so important because there are three things that you really need to consider along the way. So first of all, you need to have a think about is what you're writing, is it a promotional item? And so it may be, for example, that you're writing some sales training materials. It might be a leave piece, an e-detail aid, something like that. Or maybe you're actually involved in writing a launch letter for a new medicine. Or writing something, you know, promotional that's definitely going to be used for the sales force. Now, in these situations, hopefully you're thinking that, yes, that's promotional. Sales and marketing are involved. In which case, everything that you write has to be fully compliant with the code of practice. And it needs to be certified by the pharmaceutical company. And so somebody within the organisation, it's normally a doctor or a pharmacist, needs to check and make sure that it's fully compliant and agrees with everything within the code of practice. But... There may be items that you're writing that you think, well, these are non-promotional. Maybe you're writing some patient materials, some educational materials, or maybe you're involved in an advisory board meeting, which you know is going to be non-promotional. So you're not going to be talking about specific medicines, just disease areas. Or the third one there is maybe you're writing a manuscript, you're writing up clinical research information for publication. And what I would say here is that you're not exempt from the code because quite often, and more likely than not really, the pharmaceutical company will still want to check whatever you've prepared to make sure that it truly is non-promotional. So you still need to be really mindful of everything which is published within the code and the guidance. The third thing that you need to think about and sometimes I think this can be a missing link in a brief if you're working you know, outside of the pharmaceutical industry is how is it going to be used once it gets within the company. So let me take that example of a manuscript. Your brief as a writer may be, right, write this manuscript. And, and so your initial brief is fine, it's non-promotional. But then what if later on it is then proactively given out by sales staff? If that's the case, we've then got the situation where your clinical paper you've written actually now has become a promotional tool. And so now this has to be fully certified and fully code compliant. And so then you absolutely need to make sure that you have abided by the code. So what I'm going to do now is share with you some of the key things that I think you need to be mindful of um, to make sure that you are fully compliant in whatever you're writing. The code, bless it, has got 29 clauses. And if you find that you are time poor, really, you should be comprehensive on all of the code. But if you're going to pick one clause to read, I would say read clause seven. Um, lucky seven? No, not really, because clause seven is one of the most breached clauses out there. And it's particularly relevant for medical writers because it's all about information claims and comparisons. So this is hopefully completely up your street. 
I'm hoping though that there's nothing new, shocking you know, and within here that you think, oh my word, I have to change everything that I do. Because as professional medical writers, then this is what it's about. It's about making sure that whatever you put down is accurate, it's balanced, fair, objective. So I'm hoping, I really am hoping you're all thinking, oh my word, I need to redo everything that I do. This is, I think, just common sense and good practice. But it goes on to say that, you know, you mustn't mislead um, intentionally or, you know, inadvertently. And I think an important one here, that whatever you write has got to be based on an up-to-date evaluation of all the evidence, which does mean that you're constantly having to keep it up-to-date doing literature searches. And there have been cases in the past where companies have written promotional materials used by salespeople a new publication has come out, they've not updated it, and so it would actually be a breach of the code um, to not incorporate it. So you've got to reflect everything that's out there. And when you come to summarize it, the bottom point there is saying that whatever you write, your description has got to be sufficiently complete to allow the reader to tr truly form their own opinion. So you've got to give sufficient information that they can form that basis. Let me show you some examples. New male contraceptive pill with no side effects. You can have a read there. I particularly like the, you know, the wonder drug could cure breast cancer. Now, you might be thinking, have these really come from the pharmaceutical industry? And let me reassure you, no, they haven't, they haven't. They have come from um, a very well-known online newspaper. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to name the name, you can probably guess along the way, but it's almost like a double-edged sword because there is no way that we could use some of these words um, within the pharmaceutical industry. But, you know, the media is okay to go out and talk about, you know, Viagra without the weight. And so it's important that when you're writing to recognize that there is a certain list of banned words. The most well known out there is the word safe. But companies over the years have, have recognized that we can't say safe, so let's try a few others to get around it. So we now have a list of other words which really should not be there in your writing. So please don't say that there are no adverse reactions, there are no toxic hazards or no risks of addiction or dependency. I think that one was tried when SSRI antidepressants were first launched. Um, and so then companies have tried, oh, is it, you know, this particular drug avoids a certain side effect or it doesn't cause. And so generally speaking, try and avoid safe, proven safety demonstrated safety and it does make me smile because then some companies have said well it's placebo like and one actually tried like placebo and guess what that was a breach as, as well so quite often you'll find in writing that people talk about that the drug was generally well tolerated feels a little bland but that's the origin as to why you know that term is used you know out of preference for some of the more emotive terms going along the way so again, if you're writing that manuscript, how about something like this? You know, this drug is a safe and effective treatment for, for this condition. You might think that that is going to be the best title, attention grabbing. But again, could sales proactively give out this paper? The answer would be no. Because that word safe is in it, it would actually then be um, an exclusion, it, it wouldn't be out to, sorry, it wouldn't be code compliant. And so that would prohibit your salespeople proactively giving it out. You could use it in other ways. Um, it could still be given out, say, through a medical information department on request, but they couldn't proactively give it out. So think about things like that. Other things to watch out for, all covered in clause seven. Be careful if you talk about a unique property. You can probably be able to justify a unique mechanism of action, but if you're saying that, oh, we have a unique beta blocker, um, it's unlikely that you will find any clinical paper to back that up and to substantiate the claim. New may sound very exciting at the time, but it can only be used in a promotional context for 12 months from the point at which you start to actually actively go out there and promote it. And even saying approved by the MHRA is something that the regulators do not like. And again, that is within the code saying that you, you shouldn't be talking about it unless the MHRA have specifically said that you can name them. And then watch out for things called hanging in comparisons. So saying our drug is better. 
You've basically got to finish off the sentence, better than what? Better than placebo? Better than another drug? And then, if you're wanting to tell a story, just be really careful of emotive words. You know, hope for thousands is one that I saw recently. If you can truly justify it, then fine, but it's probably really unlikely. So watch the emotive language that you might be using. Another one, back to sort of nitty gritty clinical um, writing, which has been quite a hot topic recently, is the use of endpoints. We've got lots of endpoints that you might be talking about. Primary, secondary, the, uh, the composite, the exploratory is always an interesting one. And the code is basically saying that it's okay to use these endpoints, providing that you make it very, very clear to the reader as to what endpoint that you are talking about. And another thing to watch out that if, say, you've got a paper where the primary endpoint wasn't met, but the secondary endpoint had some really significant findings, then you've just got to make sure you talk about the secondary endpoints in context of those primaries so that we don't go and mislead the reader um, along the way. So think about that sort of thing as you go. The look and feel of what you're writing is also incredibly important. And so we've got the layout, but it's also using font size, colour, maybe using bold text to draw the reader's eye to certain phrases or words. And all these can sort of distort and exaggerate things, probably without you even thinking about it. I just want to share with you this graph. It's one that came from a case which I've sort of... Um, it's, it's not the exact case, but I've sort of put it together from the case narrative. But looking at this, you might be thinking, hmm, OK, these two drugs look the same. Or you might be thinking, actually, these drugs, oh, yes, they look significantly different. But the, the key points from this particular case is that is what is that initial impression when you look at the information? We've got in very small font there, in vitro. You may well have missed that. So it's probably that you thought, well, this is a direct clinical comparison. And even though that tiny little footer at the bottom says that there isn't a direct clinical comparison, you've probably been led to believe that, well, that must be a head-to-head -head study. And, um, you know, so that may influence your, your interpretation. And maybe you're prescribing sort of inclination as a result of that. So watch out for things like that. The other one as well you may have spotted is a scale on the left hand side and the code talks about things called suppressed zeros and we all know that there are loads of ways that we can tweak the data to distort it but really that scale on the left hand side should have started at zero so that we're not exaggerating potentially the difference in the findings. So it's ty that type of thing that again is all covered in clause 7. There's more information there, just a few things about bullet points. Um, making sure that you include patient numbers, just focus on p percentages. Put in the p-values, and if it's not significant, make it clear to the reader. And then a final little comment there is that you need to make sure that if you're writing a promotional item, then you can adapt a graph to make it co-compliant. But let me show this example just to demonstrate it, that if you have a medicine which is only on the licensed, licensed between 5 and 15 milligrams, let's say within the clinical study, they went beyond that. They did some, a study in 20 milligrams as well. If it was a promotional item, you would not be able to reproduce this graph because it provides information which is then inconsistent with the license that you've got. So it includes that 20 milligram. And so in this particular situation, you'd actually have to take out the 20 milligram information. You'd then have to flag that it was adapted, and that's how you'd need to manage it. So I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight around Clause 7. There is much, much more within the uh, code of practice, which I think is very relevant for, for writers. But I think those are the key things to think about. And if you're feeling inspired to open the code, then do have a look at Clause 7. But if you're thinking, actually, I'd need a bit of help, I'd like somebody to take me through it, then please do get in touch. I run some bespoke in-house training. I also run some open courses to, to cover this type of thing and do some online um, code webinars as well to keep you up to date. There's my website address and my email. And so please do get in touch. Many thanks.